Okay, so we are recording. Welcome everyone to another Wolf Park webinar. My name is Christopher. I'm the program coordinator here at Wolf Park, and I am thrilled to introduce three different speakers that we have tonight from two different organizations to talk uh, all things Red Wolf. So we have Ben Prater here from Defenders of Wildlife. He is the Southeastern Program Director and he holds a Master's of Environmental Management from the Nicholas School at, uh, of the Environment and Earth Sciences at Duke University. He leads a team at Defenders that is focused on the uh, protection of threatened and endangered species through public outreach, effective advocacy, and the application of science, law, and policy. And the Southeastern team of Defenders focuses on species like the Red Wolf, Florida Panther, Hellbender, and other Appalachian amphibians. So we're really excited to have Ben here today with us. We also have, have uh, Heather from Defenders of Wildlife as well. She is the Southeast Outreach Representative, and she is responsible for leading advocacy efforts uh, for the critically endangered red wolf. She works with local communities, landowners, as well as state and federal lawmakers um, and regulatory agencies to promote and support the Red Wolf Recovery Program in Eastern North Carolina. Um, and Heather joined Defenders after receiving her law degree from the University of South Carolina School of Law. So welcome, Heather. And finally, we have Kim Wheeler here with us, who is the Executive Director of the Red Wolf Coalition which is the only citizen nonprofit organization in the United States that is working exclusively for Red Wolves. And since taking on a leadership role in 2005 for the coalition, Kim has kept the organization focused on the ever-changing challenges of Red Wolf restoration and conservation. And she lives and works right in the heart of Red Wolf country and Northeastern North Carolina. So thank you again, Ben, Heather, and Kim for being with us this evening. And before I turn over the virtual mic, um, I would like to ask everybody who is tuning in via Zoom to use the Q&A feature if you have any questions rather than the chat box. Um, if you have questions, we will do our best to answer them at the end of the program. If you type them into the chat box, they may get lost. Um, so again, please use the Q&A feature. And if you're tuning in via Facebook Live, please share this with anyone you think might be interested in learning more about the Red Wolf and just type your questions into the comments. Um, so without further ado, I will turn over the virtual mic to Ben Prater from Defenders of Wildlife. Thank you, Christopher. Um, really excited to be here and wanna first welcome everyone uh, for joining us this evening and really excited uh, to have folks joining from all over the country uh, to share the story of one of the species we focus on here in the Southeast and in North Carolina, the unique and wonderful red wolf. Let's see if get this slide to advance. There we go, okay. So just a quick outline. Um, I'm gonna cover some red wolf basics. I'll be covering that talk a little bit about the history of the program, um, where we're at at present. And at that point, we'll turn it over to Kim to share. Um, and then also we'll talk more about specifically what, what hope we hold for the future. Uh, and also how you, each and every one of you can help uh, to protect this amazing animal. And then we'll move over to a, to a Q&A. So let's talk about this amazing critter. Red wolf or Canis rufus, is native to North America. It is um, so named um, the All-American Wolf. It's the only species of wolf that's completely native to North America. And it's, an, a, it's size is an intermediate between the sizes of gray wolf at one end to coyote at the other. And uh, although the exact diet of red wolves is quite variable, uh, depending on the available prey, it usually consists of a combination of white-tailed deer, raccoon, and other small mammals such as rabbits and rodents. Uh, the red wolf is an opportunistic feeder and can travel up to 20 miles a day to find food, so quite a wide-ranging animal. Uh, red wolves are mostly brown and buff colored with some black along their backs, but they do have a, a really beautiful rust or reddish hue along the ears, head, and legs. When people hear the term red wolf in their mind's eye, they often picture something that's entirely red like a red fox. But this is a good example of what a red wolf actually looks like 
in the wild. Now, adult wolves are about 26 inches or just over two feet uh, from paw to shoulder. And from nose to the tip of the tail, they can range between four and a half to up to five and a half feet. As far as weight goes, the females of the species are generally smaller. And so the range of weight is from 50 pounds up to 80 pounds, those larger males. Now in the wild, you know, wolves do in fact lead a pretty tough life. They only live for about uh, six to seven years on average. And so that means that they grow up quite quickly. Uh, they are, are breeding within that, that second year. Uh, but we do know that uh, these wolves can live up to 15 plus years in captivity. And that is really a testament to the incredible care that these animals receive uh, in their captive homes. Now, red wolves are very social creatures. They live in close-knit packs. And these packs, unlike gray wolves, typically only consist of about five to eight animals. Uh, this usually includes a breeding adult pair, along with their offspring of different years. Older offspring will often assist the breeding pair in pup rearing, so that means including uh, help with the hunting and those types of things. Now, almost all offspring um, between one and two years of age will eventually leave the pack or disperse to form their own. And red wolves tend to form pair bonds for life, and they only mate once a year. And that mating occurs actually uh, right now in the wild has just occurred in the month of February. Uh, but one of the most endearing qualities of red wolves is their amazing social behaviors and family dynamics. Here you can see a couple of, um, I think this is a brother and sister smiling and hamming it up for the camera. So again, red wolves uh, mate in late winter. And then only about two months later, uh, you get these cute little bundles of fluff and a litter of pups in the wild generally ranges between two to eight animals, usually somewhere in the middle is the, is the average. And those pups are born again in April and May. And they're done, uh, they're, they're, they're reared in very well hidden dens. Uh, they can be located in hollow trees, sand banks, uh, stream banks. They've also found dens dug into the ground near down logs or even in forest debris piles. Uh, sadly, fewer than half of wolf pups born in the wild will survive to adulthood. And those survival rates, of course, are affected by disease, uh, malnutrition, and at this small size, even predation. Um, it's important to note um, that with these wild-born litters, there's an incredible technique that was um, developed through the Red Wolf program known as pup fostering. So the red wolf population is managed in two distinct populations. There's one in captivity, which we'll talk more about how that originated, and also the wild population in Eastern North Carolina. Uh, because these animals all breed during the same type of the year and are raising pups from the same type of the year, um, scientists and managers are able to actually take pups born in captivity and place them into those wild dens, typically with a litter that's smaller in size so that the, 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 the male and female wolves in that pack can support those new pups. Amazingly, those adopted or fostered pups have, that program has been wildly successful with a 100% success rate of those animals um, from other dens being uh, raised in their, by their foster parents. So let's take a look at the history. Um, with this map, you'll notice the yellow range. Um, this depicts the historic range of the species. As you can see, the red wolf once ranged across a huge swath of the southeastern United States. But as with many other predators, a savage history of eradication and fear makes up part of that modern history. But with shifting attitudes and a new age of conservation efforts uh, that were conducted to save this imperiled species from the brink. And if you notice where that uh, rescue mission happened is highlighted in this red area in uh, Southeast Texas and Southwest Louisiana. And this represents the last stronghold for red wolves that existed in the middle of the last century. So around the 1950s and 60s, this is the only place in the world you could still find red wolves. And at this time, uh, biologists who were studying this species were so concerned about losing it forever to extinction that they worked to capture all the red wolves they could find, remove them from the wild, and started a captive breeding program. This is really the first of its kind. In fact, when the red wolves were reintroduced in Eastern North Carolina, which is indicated by that little black box in the right hand side of the map, um, this was the first reintroduction of a predator 
in uh, the history of conservation in the United States. So with the Red Wolf program, you're gonna hear us talk a lot about some of the first that were set, some of the precedents that were set for this innovative and historic program. And this was truly an historic event and really paved the way for a successful reintroduction of gray wolves in Yellowstone. In fact, the Red Wolf Recovery Program served as a model for the Yellowstone program. Now, with this map, uh, zooming out just a little bit, uh, no need to read the fine print here, but basically I wanted to show the scale of the effort to recover this animal. The blue dots represent all the known species survival program facilities. These are a group of zoos, uh, nature centers, and other wildlife centers where animals are bred in captivity with the express purpose of building up the population, maintaining genetic integrity, all in service of the wild population. Uh, currently, we have over probably 45 or more facilities in operation with red wolves uh, with a population between 230 to 250 individuals in captivity. But again, we only have one wild population on the entire planet here in Eastern North Carolina. Zooming into that landscape, you can see that unlike Yellowstone and the Gray Wolf, we don't have a huge national park surrounded by other public lands uh, where our, our wolves can find places to, to inhabit. Instead, the current range um, is actually made up of both a mixture of public and private lands, with private lands dominating the landscape. So for that reason, private lands and private landowners are critical to the success of the program long term. So getting folks to really engage, learning to coexist and make space for these amazing animals. And it's important when um, I'm often asked, well, what's in it for the landowner? Somewhat of a selfish question, but it's an important question for conservation. And there's many benefits that red wolves have on the ecosystem. Um, they can reduce uh, non-native invasive species like nutria, which can cause significant crop damage. And again, that's, that's important because a lot of the land out here is uh, used for agricultural purposes and rotation crops. And we also know, uh, mostly anecdotal, but some scientific evidence does show that because of the important um, connection to the food web that red wolves have, they help to keep under control what we call meso predators or meso carnivores, your possums, raccoons, etc. And this actually helps improve uh, nest success for turkey and quail, uh, helping to alleviate the pressure that those animals put on those eggs. And we also know that red wolves, but by taking care of the sick and weak members of the deer herd, actually help to provide a more robust and healthy herd of deer. But the wolves face a share of threats. Human caused mortality, this includes everything from vehicle strikes to unfortunate gunshots due to mistaken identity, can remove breeding animals from the wild population. Uh, these threats combined with continued uh, habitat fragmentation and increasing development um, have allowed for um, coyotes which compete for space and prey to expand into those areas. Now, although coyotes can directly compete with wolves for resources and even sometimes introduce disease um, and even dilute wolf genetics through hybridization, um, that, that's another significant threat. And that's particular, particularly uh, true uh, when we lose one of those breeding animals. Sometimes a coyote, uh, opportunistic and, a, and a, an animal without a mate looking to breed uh, will take advantage of that closely related cousin and sometimes create that hybridization issue. I will note that while that sounds uh, dramatic, uh, we know and have the science and conservation track record that has shown that we can successfully control that inner, inner, um, interbreeding, as well as the knowledge that red wolves, in fact, outcompete uh, coyotes. And with a healthy, robust red wolf population, we can see balance uh, back on the land. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Kim Wheeler to share some information with us. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. And welcome to Northeastern North Carolina, everybody. I hope everybody is having a great day. And can everybody see this? Good, all right. So um, as Christopher let, uh, introduced me, I am the director of the Red Wolf Coalition. We are located in Columbia in Terrell County, which is in the heart of Red Wolf country. 
Um, our mission, we are an advocate for the long-term survival of red wolf populations by advocating um, for, uh, by teaching about the red wolf and by fostering public involvement in um, red wolf conservation. For me, when people ask me about the wolf, for me, it all starts with the how. That is what, when I hear a wolf howl, when I hear a red wolf howl, I think about the, the fact that that sound could have been silenced. And um, that's one of, that is one of the things that resonates most with me is that how. Next, as Ben described, is the beauty of the animals. And uh, I do have a lot of people that when they see a red wolf for the first time, expected it to be this bright red, like I love Lucy, kind of Lucille Ball red. So it's, it's amazing, I think, when people um, really see that red wolves aren't as bright red. That red is behind the ears, the muzzle, and the legs. So what I want to do jumping back on task here, is go through some of the highlights of the program. Um, and I've gone all the way back to 1967. So I'll go through these pretty quickly because I want to leave um, plenty of time for Heather and plenty of time for questions. So in 1967, you can see the red wolf was listed as an endangered species under the provisions of the Endangered Species Preservation Act of 1966. So the red wolf has been on the radar of science for a very, very long time. In 1968 is when they began studying those Texas and Louisiana um, animals, which is very interesting. I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit later, but there's some of that resurgence of taking a look at, that, at those animals in Texas and Louisiana that's going on currently. In 1973, the, and the ESA becomes federal law and the fir first red wolf recovery plan is completed and implementation begins, which is exciting. In 1969, the first red wolf was placed in captivity, initiating the captive breeding program at Point Defiant Zoo. And Point Defiant Zoo still remains one of the largest facilities to house red wolves, the second one being um, the North Carolina Zoo in Asheboro, North Carolina. A lot of people ask me, how in the world did the wolves get from Texas, Louisiana to Point Defiant Zoo in Tacoma, Washington? Well, they stepped up and they were interested in being part of that captive breeding program, which has been pointed out, has been um, a very important piece of red wolf recovery. So in 1977, the first litter of red wolves born were born in captivity at Point Defiant Zoo. And in 1980, the last known red wolves were removed from the wild and the red wolf was declared extinct in the wild. So that little bit of information right there, certainly with what's going on in Texas and Louisiana, um, could prove to be a very inaccurate statement. And I know for us, we think it's pretty amazing to think that somehow all these years that somehow a resident or some form of red wolf could have survived in the wild without human any human intervention. So that research is really exciting. Um, and, I, and I look forward to the coming years as, as research is done, papers are written and further information is given. In 1987 is when the restoration program began here in Northeastern North Carolina. There were four, four pairs of captive born wolves that were released at Alligator River. Um, I've heard a lot. I've been with the coalition for 16 years. We have been in existence um, since 1997 for 24 years. We actually began, the coalition was first formed by one of the red wolf biologists who saw a need for something, education and outreach beyond what the fish and wildlife was able to do. Um, so those first captive born wolves at Alligator River, um, it's funny over the years, I've heard a lot of stories about those wolves and a lot of misconceptions. Um, one very pot, one, one, one statement I hear a lot of is that the Fish and Wildlife said those wolves would never leave the refuge. Well, the refuge doesn't have fence and wolves don't know boundaries. So we know that that probably was not an inaccurate statement. So in 1987, those first captive born wolves were, were um, released. And in 1988, the first litter of red wolf pups were born in the wild. And so, you know, I look at that, there's a lot we're gonna talk about a little bit later about the state of the current red wolf population. And I, I can't help think with a lot that's going on now, um, 
just how important all the all the lessons that were learned from 1988 when those first pups were born in the wild to today, how important that information is going to be in moving forward. So in 2002, the entire red wolf population is wild born, except for two pups that were fostered into a wild den. Um, and so what pup fostering is, is when you have a wild mom and a captive mom that have given birth within days of each other, and they, they take a genetically desirable captive pup and put it in with a wild mom. Usually they don't do first, first time parents um, because that pup that they're fostering is so critically important. They, would, they wanna make sure that the parents have some experience. And so what is really cool about pup fostering, it was um, developed by the Red Wolf Recovery Program and is one of the amazing first of the program that has gone on. Other species have been able to use pup fostering. So, um, so that got me to 2002. And then in 2018, I would say around 2012, um, Red Wolf Recovery before 2012 was going along smooth. 2012, we saw um, a, a huge increase in the number of Red Wolf deaths due to gunshot mortality. And so there was some litigation that occurred that both defenders uh, Red Wolf Coalition and Animal Welfare Institute were involved in um, against the state of North Carolina to get some rule, try to get some rules changed here because we recognize that young wolves born in the spring can be the size of an adult coyote in the fall when hunting is going on. So we were able through litigation and mediation to come to an understanding that um, there would be no hunting of coyotes at night. We figured if you can't tell the difference in the day, how in the world can you tell the difference at night? Um, so since 2012 to current, um, I would definitely say as someone who lives here in Northeastern North Carolina, we've seen a lot of change in attitudes, some good, some bad, some horrible. And so that's something collectively that all the advocates for Red Wolf, um, that is something that's on our plate every single day of the year is how do we, how do we talk to people? How do we communicate to people? And for me personally, I know that's changed since I first started with a Red Wolf Coalition. And so um, that as Ben talked about, you know, landowners and, 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 addressing fear with people and how do you do that? How do you, you know, listening to people is so critically important and acknowledging whether I agree with what they're saying or not, or whether I agree with their fears or not is incredibly important if I wanna have some sort of open conversation. Um, so I, from 2019 to 2020, um, just talking about the wild population, um, since 2019 to 2020, we have had no breeding pairs in the wild. The current wild population are 10 known. That means they wear a tracking collar. Fish and Wildlife estimates that there are other animals out there that they are not aware of. Could be anywhere from 18 to 20 animals. And so when I mentioned before about those first breeding animals, I feel like the program is almost back there again. We don't have any breeding pairs in the wild. and. Um, I'm sure we're gonna talk a little bit later about some of the efforts by the Fish and Wildlife and um, to try to make some breeding pairs. They certainly have tried, but you know, we humans can try all we want, but ultimately it's up to the animals to make that decision if they wanna to stay together or not. So at that, Heather, I'm gonna turn it over to you and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. <clears throat> <clears throat> well, thank you, Kim. Uh, let's see here. Hopefully everyone can see. There you go. Thank you, Ben. Yep. And Heather, just, right. just let me know when you want me to queue forward and I'll move them forward for you. I will. Thanks. Um, all right. Well, good evening, everybody. And uh, thanks for tuning in with us. Um, I'm going to kick it right on into gear. So uh, we've kind of, I feel like, overloaded you guys with a bit of uh, bad news and, and lots of uh, historical information. So now it's time to talk about um, the present and the future. Um, and really what I wanna talk about today um, is what are NGOs like Defenders and the Red Wolf Coalition um, doing to help this recovery effort and help restore the population of Red Wolves in the wild in North Carolina. Um, we have been taking uh, really a three-pronged approach 
And the first of those prongs is uh, building and leveraging public support focused primarily in North Carolina and on the ground locally here in the state. Um, our second approach has been through agency accountability and making sure that our legal staff, our um, internal legal strategies ensure that the uh, Endangered Species Act is being defended and enacted um, or implemented appropriately. And then third, um, we do use and put a lot of emphasis on using um, science to inform the decision making both at you know, our internal process level as well as um, the government agency. Ben, next slide. So here's an example of some of the grassroots outreach that we have done in recent years. Um, grassroots outreach remains absolutely pivotal uh, as a focus of ours here in North Carolina. This, um, this specific event was a partnership between multiple NGOs in the state of North Carolina, as a lot of our, our outreach um, efforts are. And we continue these outreach efforts uh, pretty heavily as much as we can in the era of COVID. Um, We've also ramped up our political outreach with local and federal legislators. And um, we've been very committed to bringing the best available science to bear when it comes to informing the policies that are being made. We have staff working in every corner of North Carolina and beyond. We have staff who interface regularly with people in the North Carolina Capitol, as well as on Capitol Hill in Washington, DC. Um, we work closely with agency personnel and their biologists in the recovery area. In, in 2019, we were able to secure the governor's support for red wolf conservation in North Carolina. And we helped get over 100,000 signatures in support of red wolf recovery, pushing back against fish and wildlife's um, bad regulations of 2018. Um, and you know, to get to one of the points that Kim made earlier about really getting out and talking to people, uh, this is one of my favorite, actually, oh, sorry, Ben, can you go forward? Thank you. Um, this is one of my favorite photos. It's uh, not only a partnership effort between Wildlands Network and Defenders of Wildlife, but this is an event that's in the recovery area and it really gives us um, a great opportunity to talk to people who live and work in the area and, and answer their questions, really get to their fears and, um, and, and talk to them on a one-to-one -one level as opposed to you know, just relying on newspaper articles or stuff like that to get our point across. Next slide, please, Ben. Another way that we're working to increase outreach is through education. Um, through partnerships with the North Carolina Wildlife Federation and the Wildlife Refuge Association, we've helped reopen the Red Wolf Center in Columbia, North Carolina. This facility houses two captive wolves who are very well taken care of by uh, Kim Wheeler, who's one of our panelists this evening. And, um, the center is manned by volunteers throughout the year who help educate guests on red wolves and the recovery process. Next slide, please, Ben. And pictured here are a few of our recent outreach projects. Uh, you can see a wildlife ambassadors meeting at the Pocosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuge. Um, that was a meeting of uh, local citizens uh, in the recovery area who want to talk more and, and get more involved with wildlife recovery um, or wildlife protection in, in all shapes and forms. Um, we do a lot of tabling at an event called the Southeastern Wildlife Exposition, which sees over 40,000 people each year. Um, that's in Charleston, South Carolina. And very interestingly, that event is uh, close to one of the former propagation islands, um, which is Bull Island on Cape Romaine National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, we have paid for, for uh, three years now, billboards in the recovery area that help uh, drive specifically tourism traffic from the Outer Banks into the uh, town of Columbia so that people know that the Red Wolf Center is there and they have an opportunity to go see these wolves and speak to the volunteers who are helping do the education. Um, and you'll see we have Concert for Conservation, which was actually um, a, a really cool effort put together by Christopher Lyle, who um, is very ingrained in the um, musical community and the church community in Western North Carolina, and has raised a lot of money for the recovery effort through um, these concert, concerts for conservation. And then finally, um, another uh, form of art, art um, outreach that we do is we've worked very closely with a sculptor. Um, his name is Dale, uh, Dale Weiler. 
yes, Dale Weiler, and he um, had made this excellent, excellent sculpture that I am not sure you guys can see really well there in the middle, but it is um, on display many places around the southeast at this time and um, has really gotten a lot of attention um, for red wolves. Next slide, please. So we mentioned science is one of the lenses that we are looking for looking toward the future through. In fact, Defenders is a science based organization at its heart. We're focusing on the science and human dimensions to develop a comprehensive vision for red wolf recovery effort that engages leading scientists and works with landowners and local communities through incentive programs and coexistence strategies. We're leading with partners such as the Smithsonian and the Association for Zoos and Aquariums to build scientific understanding like taxonomy and genetic research to address conservation challenges like how to deal with coyote management and gunshot mortality with red wolves uh, to advance recovery planning and to identify new potential recovery sites. Next slide, please. So you have heard us talk a little bit about this um, Gulf Coast population. And you know, as Kim alluded to earlier, this is really cool. Um, this, I, I think as a community, we don't really know what these animals mean just yet, but just the fact that they're there um, and they're kind of thriving is, is really exciting for a lot of us. So you'll have to forgive this photo. Um, it was taken, uh, from a distance, so the resolution is not great, but um, these canids have been seen um, in an area on Galveston Island, uh, which is very, very close to where the last wild red wolves were pulled out of in the 50s and 60s. Um, red wolf genes have been discovered to be persisting in the wild in these canids. Um, researchers have found animals in both Texas and Louisiana with red wolf DNA. This means that despite you know, a, a horrible uh, ex extirpation effort, red wolf genes have survived both in the presence of coyotes and with no human intervention. This really turns some of the classic arguments against red wolf recovery on their head. And this also has implications for policy and the implementation of the Endangered Species Act and how to protect these unique genes that have managed to survive on the, in the environment. Um, again, this is all really new science, so uh, the best thing we can say is that organizations like Defenders and Red Wolf Coalition remain in the vanguard as, you know, we learn more and figure out how to use this information to help recovery in places like North Carolina. Next slide, please. So today marks a new dawn for Red Wolves. We're really at a, a pivotal turning point. Never before has there been such strong public support for Red Wolves for such incredible partnerships on the ground that are supporting the species. Now the responsibility rests solely on the shoulders of our state and federal wildlife agencies to see this through. Uh, both Defenders and Red Wolf Coalition are involved in federal litigation to encourage Fish and Wildlife to recommit in the next administration. There will be no future for Red Wolves without more releases from the captive population and additional recovery areas. Next slide. So let's talk about what you guys can do to help. Um, you know, what you can do right now, of course, there is a laundry list of things, but here are some of our highlights. Uh, speak up, take action, you know, use social media. We all have a platform. I know um, a lot of our, our viewers tonight are on Facebook Live, so you have no excuse. Um, just, you know, use any platform that you have, be it uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you know, tell your friends, talk about this. Um, write a letter to the editor or an, um, an op-ed. Those are always really helpful and can really help um, get the word out to different audiences that perhaps social media might not um, really get at very efficiently. But above all else, just continue your steadfast support for NGOs like Defenders and the Red Wolf Coalition and Wolf Park. Um, you know, these organizations do a lot of the heavy lifting and, and really fight the good fight. And, um, and we know that you agree with that because you're here with us tonight. Next slide. So I believe we are at the question section of the evening.
Excellent. Well, thank you all so much, um, Ben, Heather, and Kim, for sharing this wonderful presentation with us and for all of your excellent and very hard work and dedication on um, restoring and conserving the red wolf population in North Carolina um, and where people can go from here. So we do have some questions coming in uh, already um, that we can start throwing out to you guys if you are ready and you guys can um, each answer the questions or bounce them back and forth however works best for you. Um, and one uh, interesting question that is coming in is uh, with the red wolf being such an iconic species and so important to North Carolina, have there been any efforts to try and change the state mammal of North Carolina to the red wolf? That's a great question. I'll jump in first and then you guys. So one thing um, that we didn't really cover is um, here in North, in, in North Carolina, the um, North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission, who is our governing body for wildlife, has not been on board with the Red Wolf Recovery Program. So I don't know if there have been any efforts. I just can't imagine up to this point that that would have anything that would have been very successful. Um, not because residents of, the, the, of North Carolina don't want it, but I'm not sure that our resource commission would even support anything like that. It's, it's one of, certainly one of the challenges moving forward of Red Wolf Recovery, wherever they go, is to get that state agency involved. And to actually name an animal as an official state animal, it does actually rely on legislation. And, and I would say that up until now, and, and maybe even now, <laughs> the uh, political um, situation in North Carolina has been a bit of a minefield when it comes to you know, proactive conservation. However, um, you know, we have thought about this a little bit, um, mainly because we um, have seen other successful efforts, particularly if they've been led by student groups. Uh, it's very hard for politicians to tell third graders that something is not important. Uh, when it's Kim or I beating down the door of, of the governor, uh, they may not be so, so eager to listen, but I think there's potential opportunity and it would certainly be a great way uh, to build pride in this species. It's worked wonders for us in the state of Florida with the Florida panther being uh, classified as the state mammal. Uh, you know, because something that um, we were all talking about this before we jumped on to the recording is that we're still amazed at how people don't even know this animal mm -hmm. exists, even folks here in North Carolina. Uh, we don't have that problem in Florida, mainly because this animal is appreciated and there's pride and you know, uh, bumper stickers and license plates. So I would love to see something like that here in North Carolina at some point. Excellent answer. Very informative. Thank you, guys. Um, and why was Eastern North Carolina selected as the area for reintroduction over other areas of their historic range? That's a great question. Um, and I, for me, you know, particularly with this program and the amazing history of it, I, I'm always um, uh, get excited about some of the serendipitous moments that occur. Um, when scientists, you know, they, they, they took those animals out of the wild with every intention of, or getting them back on the ground in wild places. And quite frankly, having lost so much of the territory, having not been you know, under the, the scrutiny of science for some time, there's a lot of mysteries and unknowns and uncertainties about where the right place to do this grand experiment would be. Uh, and just about the time that we were getting animals ready to be released and looking at sites, um, a significant donation, I believe from Prudential Insurance Company, uh, divested a lot of their land in Eastern North Carolina in an area called the Albemarle Peninsula, uh, which is, of course, the peninsula and the home of the current Red Wolf Recovery Area, over to the federal government to, to uh, form uh, significant portions of the National Wildlife Refuge System. Now, what's interesting is under the Endangered Species Act, in order to reintroduce a species and to make sure it has the full voter protection of the law, doing that on federal lands is critical. So having that core federal, federal habitat on a peninsula, which could essentially help us to really monitor and in some ways contain a wide ranging animal to study it further. It just became such a sweet spot for where we could make this reintroduction happen. Now, since that time, you know, there have been questions about, was it the right place? You know, are these animals, do they enjoy the coast? Do they like swamps? And the truth of the matter is the red wolves have shown us the way. 
uh, to put it simply. They have thrived in the area. Now, granted, their population is in quite a, a difficult spot right now, but at one time, not too long ago, in the 30-year history of the program, we had nearly 150, uh, at least 130 animals on that landscape. So um, I think that is probably an indication of really how many individuals that current landscape can contain. So we're still far away from reaching that mark. Um, but as Heather mentioned, you know, one of the key aspects of recovery, and even as spelled in black and white in the recovery plan, is to have more than just one recovery area, having more than just one wild population. And that's really critical because that comes down to a core tenet of conservation biology, which is to have redundancy. In other words, you have to have more places with more wolves to ensure that population dynamics can play out to have a self-sustaining population. So once we build that population back up in North Carolina, there are plenty of other places where these wolves can, um, can eke out a living and do quite well. You know, one thing that's important to keep in mind is that wolves are very adaptable. Uh, they, they, um, they can really adapt to all kinds of conditions and do well in a variety of habitats. Um, I think one of the things we have to recognize and another really tough lesson we are uh, learning and have learned in North Carolina is it's not always enough just to have the biological needs for the species met to sustain a population. You also have to have a tolerant population uh, guided by robust policies that protect local wildlife. So for example, it may not make sense for us to try to get a species, try to get red wolves reintroduced to an area where people don't want them. The state is rejecting the science about what they are or they don't have policies to protect them during hunting season. So that social dimension is really key and actually is leading a lot of the current scientists to explore that as a really important, you know, for lack of a better term, layer of consideration when we are looking at which areas uh, really glow on the map for good reintroduction sites. Ben, I wanna jump in here um, because I'm looking through the question and answer and there's another um, really uh, closely related question about you know, how to start looking for other recovery areas. Um, and one thing we wanna be really clear about is that you know, I think all of us feel that there is no future for red wolves without North Carolina. Um, you know, it's just one of those things that, you know, if any other state starts looking at this program, um, the first thing they're going to ask is, well, how did it go for 30 years in North Carolina? So, you know, we are really un unwilling to, um, to abandon efforts in this state whatsoever. Um, and I, I think that's one of the, the things that we've been really cautious about proposing new recovery areas and, and jumping and moving really heavily forward there because, you know, we would hate for the eye to be taken off the ball of um, what's really important here in this state right now. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ben and Heather. And um, have a lot of questions coming in that are really great. Um, a new one that just popped up that kind of goes along with what you both have been talking about is um, what initiatives are being taken to ensure that communities where red wolves are reintroduced or plan to be reintroduced are supportive of their recovery? Well, I think you've heard quite a few, but I want to, you know, pause and give uh, props to Kim, who is really, uh, and Red Wolf Coalition, who have really done such the lion's share of the work over the decades in really making sure that education plays a key role in how we learn to coexist and share the landscape with this animal. Um, and I wanna just you know, let Kim respond, but we do have some important initiatives that we're funding on the ground that we hope to put in place this year that I'm, I'm very excited to talk about, but I wanted to make sure Kim has a chance to weigh in first. No, and thank you, Ben. And that is our focus has been education and outreach. That's all we do. Um, and that's all we've been doing for 24 years. And so, you know, for me, it's, it's getting the opportunity pre-COVID to be able to go into the local schools. Um, I have schools outside the recovery area that we do an annual Zoom call with, um, you know, talking with civic groups. Um, even though COVID has been a challenge for that face-to-face, -face, um, in some respects, it's been really kind of good to be able to do these Zoom calls because in, in a lot of circumstances, we've been able to get out further than just the recovery area. So. I can't really complain that much, you know. I do miss, it's hard to show a pelt or a skull on a Zoom call, but still it's that opportunity to talk to people and do things like we're doing now. 
Um, not that this wouldn't have gone on without COVID, but I just think there are other opportunities to be able to reach out. And, um, and we have a lot of great partners like Defenders of Wildlife and other NGOs that, um, you know, we just had something a couple of weeks that came up where I needed somebody who had contacts in Washington. I called Ben and said, I need your help. This is what's going on. I'm sitting here in North Carolina. I don't have a lot of those contacts. So we have to all work together. And that's really, really important. Heather showed the um, Red Roof Education Center here in Columbia. The building was built by the Fish and Wildlife, but the coalition, coalition was able to secure funding for all the perimeter fence, the interior fence, and the um, bleachers, which is now, well, before COVID, was able to really educate people coming through the recovery area, which is so incredibly important. So I think education and communication will always remain at the top of the list on what we have to do um, and communicating with people that like wolves and don't like wolves. Um, it's still an open communication. I learn things when I talk to people that don't like wolves because it's, it's, it's to me interesting to get to why, what about the wolf don't they like? And lots of times it's they don't like the government. Mm -hmm. And so as I am getting older and I'm getting older and been in this job more, that's probably the one thing I've learned the most is how I approach people has changed and how that's so important in, in this political time that we're living in, as Ben mentioned here in the state of North Carolina. Um, how do we change some of those opinions and get people to really you know, get excited? We have the only wild red wolf population in the world here in Northeastern North Carolina. I mean, how many times can you say that? Like, why are we not standing on the chair screaming at the top of our lungs like, yay? And I know a lot of us have tried to get NC State, which are the wolf pack, to try to change to the red wolf. And that, we get a little headway and then we get pushed back a little bit. That's, that's a tough sell. So um, yeah, it's, yeah, that's a tough sell. <laughs> you know, and what Kim's really talking about, you know, with that education, it creates opportunities for conversation. And that's really where the magic happens. You know, oftentimes when we're talking with landowners, their backs are kind of against the wall. You know, they have sometimes, you know, hard-boiled, you know, anti-government you know, government sentiment. They're, um, you know, self-starters, folks that have eked out a living on these landscapes for, for centuries. Um, and, you know, it's important to recognize that, unfortunately, through the loss of predators like red wolves, like puma across the landscape, you know, we have generations of people that have never had to live beside these wild animals. And to all of a sudden have them back in the landscape is quite a bit of a sort of, you know, uh, a shock to the system. So it, it's important that we take very careful measured steps and make sure that those conversations are collaborative as we seek solutions. So one of the words you're going to hear me say uh, is the term coexistence. This is really something that uh, Defenders has been a leader and innovator on. You know, we were the first um, folks to get behind incentive programs for gray wolf reintroduction, range rider programs, and monitoring all kinds of other things to help reduce incidents of depredation and, and wildlife conflict. You know, one of the great models we've developed here in the Southeast was with the Florida Panther. Um, and one of the things we've done for Florida Panthers is, you know, a lot of uh, private landowners uh, in the area, you know, you do have these large cattle ranches and that's a whole different animal. We've done some successful work there, but with these small landowners who may have a chicken coop or a few pet goats or other hobby livestock, you know, that has created opportunities, uh, you know, again, Puma, like red wolf, are, are opportunistic predators. Uh, and so when you put easy prey out, they could be attracted to that. So we want to minimize those conflicts from occurring. So the way we've done that in Florida is actually enter into a cost share program with other NGOs and the landowner to erect uh, predator resistant enclosures for uh, those, those livestock and those animals, pets, et cetera. And I'm excited to report that this year, uh, we're going to be expanding that program and beginning to test it out on the ground in Eastern North Carolina. Now, one of the things that we're hopeful for is that these enclosures will not only uh, work to deter red wolves, which quite frankly are not really the problem, uh, they get blamed for a lot, but coyotes and honestly black bear are probably the biggest problem with uh, creating human wildlife conflict. These enclosures are resistant to those species as well. So what we're hoping is that these uh, conversations can result in some actual action and support for landowners. So they can feel that there's a level of partnership with us, that we move away from the antagonism that we oftentimes get, get pitted with because things have gotten so bad in many cases. 
Um, but working through in a collaborative way that is solutions oriented and is proactive, I think we can begin to change some attitudes. We've already seen that happen uh, in Florida. People are more willing to accept a predator in the landscape when they know that you know, they and their pets and their kids and their, their livelihoods are safe. So I think we, uh, by putting that novel program to work on the ground in North Carolina, uh, could, could present a bit of a seat change. So I'm very hopeful about that. Thank you, Ben and Kim and Heather all for that. I wanna keep our questions grouped um, together as much as possible. Um, so um, a couple last points to hit on in terms of reintroduction areas and coexisting like you're talking about, Ben. Um, a lot of people are interested in essentially what needs to happen to facilitate other areas for reintroduction and recovery. Um, because like you mentioned, a lot of people have never had to coexist with a predator. You've already talked a little bit about that, but if you wanna add anything else in terms of um, helping facilitate new areas potentially after North Carolina um, gets their population on track, and are there any other states that are um, currently open to taking on um, potentially that Red Wolf recovery effort if North Carolina gets back on track? Yeah, great, great question, Christopher. And I, I want to underscore one of the things you said, because it goes back to something Heather said, is that we have to have that, you know, what engineers would call proof of concept in North Carolina. We need to demonstrate that not only this, can this program succeed for the wolves, but it can be, succeed uh, without creating conflict or harm to private landowners and other wildlife resources. Uh, we have the science on our side. We have the wild places on our side, but we're not gonna be able to, to recover this animal just on public lands. So we do have to have that landscape of tolerance. And that's really where the cutting edge has to be focused right now. So once we get the program in North Carolina back on track, um, I think we'll be in a good position to start thinking about other areas to consider. Now, granted, that doesn't mean we need to wait on having very critically important conversations. And there are other organizations, um, members in the SSP that are having those conversations in places like Missouri, Arkansas, Virginia. You know, the word is out. Many, many people, many, many organizations want these animals. They take pride in recognizing that as uh, Americans, we are better off having all the species that are native to this landscape on the landscape. You know, it's not enough just to have these animals curated in zoos, but it is important to realize that our zoos do play such a critical role in maintaining the genetic integrity and robust size of a population that can withstand uh, putting wolves out onto the ground. Because once those animals were out of captivity, there's no guarantee for their safety. So we have to be able to give them the best chance they can have. And that's one of the things we're really dialing in and working on um, and hoping to see happen with Fish and Wildlife Service in North Carolina is what can we do to ensure success, to make sure that these animals, when they're put out on the ground, they can breed, they can find mates, they can rebuild their population. The, the, the wolves will do the work. We just have to kind of get out of their way. Um, but also in these areas where we have these little, you know, opportunities or doors cracked to have these conversations, they've got to happen yesterday. Because what we don't want to have happen you know, and it was, it was a learning process in North Carolina, but I don't feel there was necessarily enough, you know, outreach done at the onset to get folks comfortable with, with the idea. Now, granted, some might argue it's not, they're not, they're not in control. You know, people shouldn't get to decide the fate of an endangered species. I personally would find myself in that camp, but having seen and suffered through the ups and downs of the Red Wolf Program, I have to say that uh, that's a bit of an arrogant approach, and we are going to need to make sure we have state, federal, and private landowners all on board to make this a success. That's really the recipe for it. Uh, and also making sure that we're tamping down at every uh, chance the myths that still unfortunately persist, the fears that still unfortunately persist. You know, we've got to get Red Riding Hood out of our lexicon. We need to be thinking about the benefits that these animals um, although they can potentially be scary and or dangerous in terms of the, our mind's eye and thinking about them, they are important to us, our natural heritage, and our ecosystems. So if I could I just add one. Oh, go, ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Kim. <laughs> just real quick, I want to say when the Fish and Wildlife first started this program, they did about a year of education and outreach. And the one question that they did not know the answer to is what would a captive born animal do in the wild? So moving forward for other reintroduction sites, they have 30 plus years of history. Um, they have an idea now about what captive born wolves will do 
in the wild, which is going to be incredibly important for the next stage, for the next state, for the next state agency that they talk to. And so they have a lot of questions that they'll be able to answer that they were not able to answer back in 1987. And um, my final little point here, I think I'll just add is that, you know, like Ben was saying earlier, we are dealing with you know, generations worth of people who have never had to live on, on a landscape with a predator of any sort. Um, and I think we're seeing that pop up a lot with the, um, the real fear and hate of coyotes. Um, you know, not even talking about red wolves, but just uh, a coyote or, you know, even a fox even. There's a lot of stigma around these species. And I, I think one thing for those of you who are really like, gunning at the bit to do something, you know, start working at the local city and county levels, wherever you work and, and really hit home these, these coexistence measures to, to live alongside wildlife. Um, set that primer in your own community. So whether it's the Red Wolf or the Eastern Cougar or the Florida Panther, wherever you are, as these species start coming back together in their natural habitats, hopefully they won't be facing such an uphill battle because we've done some of that legwork and that education on the front side already. Yeah. And, and Heather, that's, a, that's an excellent point. I just want to piggyback a little bit and just share that, you know, it doesn't have to only be sort of the mythic big scary critters to achieve coexistence. You know, as a wildlife organization, you can imagine the barrage of emails and questions I get in my inbox every day, uh, particularly in the spring with, oh, I found a baby rabbit, or oh no, my bird feeders are getting mauled by bears, whatever it might be. You know, coexistence is really about an attitude and a pattern of behavior that makes room for animals and shares the landscape. So it doesn't have to just be for predators. It can be for songbirds. It can be for amphibians in your backyard. You know, all, any of the things you can do, even the products you buy at the grocery store can have an impact on wildlife indirectly. So it starts with shifting the attitude, making room and putting thought to, to how wildlife could benefit or be harmed by our own behavior. And I think that, you know, as we raise our children and grandchildren and think more about exposing them to wild things, you know, whether it's the bird feeder at the back window or a quick nature hike, it's always important to have these lessons imparted that, you know, part of our responsibility is to be good stewards of resources and the planet. You know, we are as much tied to nature as any other part of it. Uh, and I think for too long, whether it's through, you know, I mean, you can, we can wax philosophical all you like, but I think there's been just a, a pretty significant disconnect. Uh, many folks call it the urban rural divide. I think it's a little bit more, a little deeper than that, you know, and it's the fact that we're far removed from really relying on nature as directly as we once did. Um, and so I think as we start to turn back to look at those ways or consider our place in, in the world uh, and how we can support wildlife, it's about making those better decisions. And if we can all do that, and if that just becomes part of what our culture is rooted in, I think many of the arguments we wrestle with today will be a thing of the past by the time hopefully my kids are sitting in, in my shoes. Thank you guys so much for those um, beautifully worded answers. And um, I do wanna be respectful of everyone's time and we have a lot of questions left to answer. So we may need to switch to more of a speed round. We have one more question related to um, kind of locations for red wolves. And that is why didn't the Smoky Mountain uh, National Park work for red wolf recovery? And then we can move on into some different uh, directions for our questions. Sure, that's a quick one and I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to be quick. <laughs> but um, re I remember when I said that the, the real thing that people were looking at, scientists were looking at in the early stages of the re recovery effort was where we had a significant core block of public land. Well, when you look at the map, guess what glows in bright green? The Great Smoky Mountains National Park. It is quite honestly the crown jewel of the Appalachians, rugged, wild, beautiful area. Um, but for all the reasons that made it, you know, um, it, it was a, came with a double-edged sword, I guess is one way to put it. So, you know, in that rugged terrain, you, the, the, the leading hypotheses behind why the program ultimately did not uh, take or had to be, uh, you know, I, I argue prematurely abandoned was there wasn't a significant enough prey base. But another significant problem was that um, the uh, rugged terrain made it very difficult to track, locate wolves with technology at the time, because they needed to have veterinary care because these wild canines are just as susceptible to domestic dog diseases like parvo 
and not being able to vaccinate pups can make them very vulnerable to those diseases as well. And also, like we've reiterated, I think Kim and Heather and myself all made the point, you know, wolves don't read maps. Uh, I think that was probably my favorite quote I ever had in the Washington Post is wolves don't read maps. And it's true. You know, those park boundaries don't exist for these animals. And you can't fault a red wolf for taking itself out from Clingman's Dome, finding a nice, you know, uh, bucolic pasture to pick off, you know, goats and cows. So um, again, we have to let these wolves show us the way. Their behaviors tell us a lot about what we can do to help, you know, pave a better way for them. But some of those early conflicts created a bit of a panic. And those are sort of the three variables, at least in terms of when I talk to folks that sort of result in an ultimate decision to, to pull the plug on that program. Now, granted, a lot has changed. Uh, we have better technology. We have better resources. As Kim pointed out, we have 30 years of history that have told us what these wolves are capable of. And so um, I think it may be appropriate to re-examine the Appalachians as another opportunity uh, for reintroduction. You know, and one thing that it also leads me to consider, I know I promise to be short and I've already uh, lied to you, but um, is as you move to the Northern Appalachians, you also have a much friendlier policy landscape for wildlife and you have much less pressure from hunting and potential poaching and trapping. So perhaps in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Southern New York, still part of the historic range, you may have opportunities that exist there too. Thank you, Ben. Um, and we have a question, let me find it again, from Ian, who is eight years old in Western North Carolina, who would uh, really like to know how many uh, red wolves exactly are left in the wild. There are um, 10 known wolves and they were a tracking collar. The Fish and Wildlife believes that there are other wolves out there that they've not been able to trap in the last couple of years. That could be anywhere from 18 to 20. Yeah, and Ian, I think another important thing to think of is that um, we also have, uh, I believe the number I have is correct. Kim, you can, you can correct me, but uh, nearly 250 animals uh, amongst those SSP facilities. Yep. So in total, we've got quite a number of wolves. Um, and that's really important because in order to get those numbers up, as Heather pointed out, we're going to have to release more wolves uh, into the wild so they can sustain that population. Thank you. And um, we have a question about uh, the differences between red wolf and coyote howls. And if there is a difference, is that something that could be used to help conserve red wolves? So a red wolf, if most of us know a, a wolf howl by the a gray wolf, it's that deep baritone. Um, a, a red wolf is somewhere in between um, a coyote and a gray wolf. Um, a red wolf howl is a little higher pitched, but not as yappy and yippy as a coyote. Um, if you've ever, I always tell people, go out at night and howl and see what happens. I've been surprised <laughs> on many an occasion. I did that one night and um, I happened to find out that there were a, a, a pack, a group, I don't know how many, because sometimes howls can sound like a lot and it can only be two or three that were right next door on the other side of my neighbor's house. So um, yeah, go out at one night and howl and see what you get, so. So a funny little anecdote. Uh, there's a great book out there written by Deline, Dr. Deline Beeland. Uh, it's called The Secret World of Red Wolves. So if you want to get steeped in red wolf history, that's a great book to check out and, and to buy. Um, but she tells the story of how the biologists in the early days of trying to rescue these animals from the southeast Louisiana and south, excuse me, southeast Texas, south, southwest Louisiana, uh, biologists actually use acoustic survey to track uh, where those red wolves are. They were able to use recordings and distinguish between the unique uh, signatures of red wolf howl versus other canids. And that was something that led them to that effort. So, um, and I know Kim has let, used to lead a lot of great educational trips where folks could really hear that howl. And, 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 and in many ways, um, that sound is just so emblematic of, of, of the wild. And I think, um, you know, one thing I hope for, our, my vision for the future is to hear those voices sing out again across the landscape. Uh, because I don't think there's anything in this world that is as moving and sort of goosebump inducing as hearing a wild wolf call. Um, so hopefully we can hear those voices again soon. Absolutely, I hope so. And um, I know just from working with you all that you're, you all are involved um, in this process right now and probably cannot speak a whole lot, but we do have a question asking um, if there is anything you can comment on regarding the recent court injunction 
um, and the Fish and Wildlife Service's appeal of the ruling. And then we have some other policy related questions as well. Yeah, Christopher, thank you. And, and I appreciate a little bit of grace, recognize the sensitivity of being involved in litigation. Uh, but what I can say is that right now is a unique opportunity and a bit of a turning point for the Red Wolf program. Uh, over the past, you know, little less than a decade, maybe eight years, we've really seen um, agencies, both at the state and federal level, uh, unfortunately turn their back on the program, you know, abdicate a bit of the responsibility of, of marching towards recovery, just getting by and doing just enough. Um, our um, legal strategy and legal advocacy has helped to, uh, as Heather pointed out, hold these agencies accountable and remind them of what their, what their true mission is. Um, now, the current litigation, I think, is the good news is that, you know, at every turn, the federal courts have agreed that Fish and Wildlife Service was not doing enough to protect the species. And a product of the most recent uh, litigation was to require Fish and Wildlife Service to take that aggressive step to get back on track with releases and develop a plan. Uh, that plan is currently being evaluated and is being evaluated by the court and various experts that may be called to testify on it. But the bottom line is we are making gains and we have a unique opportunity, hopefully um, uh, supported by a much better political climate to get this program back on track. And I'll just say that anyone who works closely with these animals, they're ready to see that change happen. So I am, I am eager and I feel very optimistic that once the mechanisms that we need to get the program back on track or back in the toolbox, we'll get right back to work. And no matter um, you know, how heated things have become, at the end of the day, we're all in it for the Red Wolves and we're gonna make progress. Thank you, Ben. Um, and we have a question, are island propagation sites still being used to increase Red Wolf populations? Yes. St. Vincent's Island in Florida. Um, last year and this year, there were animals that were translocated here into Northeastern North Carolina, hopefully to make pairs. Um, last year, the pairs, the animals were put together in an acclimation pen for about 30 days. Um, unfortunately, again, it's all up to the wolf. We humans can do all we want. Um, those pairs, um, they sort of went their own separate way. Um, this year, um, there were two males that were brought and when they were released out of their acclimation pen, one of them unfortunately was uh, killed by a vehicle and the other one is staying in the general vicinity of the female he was paired with. So that has become critical as we move forward um, because it is a place, a reservoir to bring um, genetically desirable animals here to Northeastern North Carolina. Um, and um, certainly moving forward, that population is gonna be really, really important along with, as Ben and Heather have mentioned, um, releases from the captive population. Thank you. Um, and another question, um, kind of policy oriented is, what is the legal ramification to someone who um, kills a red wolf? So red wolves are legally protected under the Endangered Species Act. On public lands, uh, they receive the full force of the act, are listed as critically endangered, uh, and that would be a significant crime. Unfortunately, because the red wolf, it has a very unique designation, and, and this would be a whole other presentation to go into the history and, and reasons behind that, but the bottom line is they are treated as an experimental population, which unfortunately, uh, for the wolves at least, means that when they get onto other lands, whether it be state or private lands, they are, are um, treated as threatened. Uh, now granted, poaching is still completely illegal, but unfortunately, if someone were to accidentally shoot a red wolf and claim that it was an accident, there's really not a lot we can do for repercussions. Now, the, the problem is, and you know, Heather's the lawyer, so I can let her speak to this, but it does come down to intent. And quite honestly, um, you know, law enforcement with federal law enforcement is very, um, reticent to bring a case that they can't complete. Um, and even if they do win those cases, the penalties for poaching are quite mild when you think about losing, you know, one of the last animals that represents a population on earth. 
So I think it's more of an issue about changing attitudes and behaviors and making that kind of disgusting behavior of poaching completely unacceptable uh, versus more of an issue of law enforcement. Um, and, you know, I grew up hunting and fishing. I know Heather grew, grew up and still hunts and, and, and angles. And I think that, um, you know, I grew up in the ethics I were taught uh, where, you know, there's no, no one's more despised in the hunting community than a poacher. But somewhere along the lines that has kind of changed. There's, there's a real uh, difficult perversion that's kind of creeped in um, to, to, some of, to some of those um, places. And we, we've seen that play out. There's some, some pretty nasty characters when it comes to the Red Wolf country and, and folks that are very antagonistic. Um, but I, I, I see, you know, there's no moral or no ethical, um, uh, is there, is it, it's, it, that's just, again, disgusting. But um, I do hope that if we ever do have a clear case that is poaching, that they will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. You know, we have had incidents um, of poaching and Red Wolf Coalition and Defenders and others have offered rewards for, pers uh, for prosecution. So there is some of that pressure. But uh, I think that it also starts again, just like everything else, kind of at home and what you teach your kids. So, I'll um I'll add a couple of points there. So you know, first and foremost, whether or not the red wolf is an endangered species, you know, landowners in the recovery area, if if a wolf is actively attacking them, their pet, they're destroying any of their property, going after their livestock, they do have you know the ability to protect themselves and you know their their pets and their cows, goats, whatever. Um, but, you know, another point is also, that unfortunately, a lot of times, you know, these cases, like Ben said, there's a lot of intent that goes into, you know, deciding what level of legal ramification that there could be. Um, you know, for a, a number of years, there was a policy that basically said that um, if you, in good faith, thought you were shooting a coyote, that you were okay. Um, and that made it really difficult for uh, fish and wildlife to hold people accountable for, for really a number of years. And that policy, I think, was just thrown out finally two or three years ago. Um, and then another, another thing just to keep in mind is the landscape of where these wolves are at. And often by the time, you know, the bodies are recovered or fish and wildlife have an idea that one of the wolves has died, um, the, the level of decomposition is pretty severe um, and it can be really hard to, to trace that, that line, you know, back to where, wherever the bullet came from. Um, and again, you know, I, like Ben was getting to, we, we hate to put all the emphasis on catching and punishing the wrongdoers while, you know, it is so obvious to us that what they're doing is detrimental and devastating to this program. Um, they, those people are still such a small fraction of, of really who we're, we're working with to educate and, and outreach to every single day. And I personally, you know, I'm one of those, I'm not going to give oxygen to a fire I don't want to burn. So, um, you know, there, again, there's such a small population of wrongdoers that I think we really should focus on, on the positives and, and what we have been doing really well in the recovery area. Thank you guys. Um, and another question is, what is the political argument against the conservation of red wolves and how can we better equip ourselves to combat negative opinions towards them? And I know you guys have already kind of hit on a lot of that in terms of um, facilitating a lot of education, but anything else you might want to add on um, those political arguments and how um, citizens can more effectively um, combat those? Well, I've got a list. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll go down them and and you know what I what I it, to this question what I often joke to people is like I'm in the excuse minimizing business and a lot of those like questions about sort of the arguments against wolves are really more excuses so the excuse we hear probably most frequently is it's too expensive yeah you know what else is expensive extinction you know losing an animal from the fabric of local ecology is, is devastating to the environment um, and I, if anyone says the Red Wolf program is too expensive, they should do a little research and look at how much money we put towards salmon recovery in the West. Um, so the Red Wolf is about middle of the pack. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
And and I and, and again that that sort of financial argument you're not going to win you're not going to win me over on it um, because you know we we've got money to spend it almost anywhere else but you know when it comes to the environment it's always getting the short end of the stick so whole another debate uh, other political arguments have been around the taxonomy well we we put the nail in that coffin you know there's no more arguments that red wolves are unique distinct and worthy of protection. Um, I think some of the other arguments are, you know, we just don't want them here. And that's tough. And that's kind of where that coexistence effort really comes in. But again, it's not necessarily um, up to individual landowners to dictate uh, how wildlife resources are managed. Now, we should do that in partnership. But, you know, you don't get a vote as to what animals, you know, cross, cross your boundaries. Um, and that's probably the, the main ones we hear is the economic argument the taxonomic argument and just the you know tolerance argument really uh, but to be honest there really is it has not been a lot of strong arguments made um, that would detract from the red wolf recovery effort now when you get over into gray wolves and you're talking about populations that are nearing or have had recovered as a whole another political animal um, i should also point out that some of the classic western arguments about you know wolves versus livestock or you know, livelihood versus um, uh, wolves, those don't really uh, pan out in red wolf country. Most of the uh, production on the landscape is for agricultural products, not for livestock. So we don't have those kind of classic, you know, the poor rancher or poor sheep farmer that's got to deal with losing animals. Uh, and But also the federal government has plenty of mechanisms to compensate and, and deal with those. And we've been at the vanguard of helping us those along too. Um, so yeah, most of those political arguments fall flat, but like with anything, with enough misinformation, you'd be surprised what you can achieve. So the only thing I would add that I hear a lot about, or that we, we hear a lot about, is um, competition. Um, people that um, fill their freezers with food, deer, not bear, but other, other animals, um, really, really believe that the wolves are killing all the deer, just as a perfect example, is something we've all heard time and time again. We know it's not true, um, but it's something that locals see because there are so many people that are so generational here. Um, again, conversations that I've had where someone says, I used to walk this field with my grandfather and the deer were just out grazing and we saw them all the time. And then you have to sort of wind it back a little bit, or I do, and say, okay, have there been any habitat changes? Was this farmland? Was it forest land? What, what did this land look like? What changes have occurred around it? There are natural changes in an ecosystem. We have another predator on the landscape now in the coyote. So deer, no matter how smart or dumb we think they are, know <laughs> that there are other predators on the landscape. So where those deer used to be out in that field grazing, now maybe they graze and now they're in the brush. I know in, in talking and working with the field staff for the last 16 years, that was a conversation I had quite often with them. What were they seeing about deer so that I could address those questions? And they were seeing the same thing and that the deer were in the brush a lot. They were seeing signs that they were in the brush. So those natural things that happen on the landscape are really important to talk to people about. I acknowledge, um, yes, someone may feel like they have to hunt a little bit longer, a little bit further, and maybe in a different manner than they used to, but it's not all because of the wolf. I mean, as we mentioned before, there are 10 known wolves on the landscape. So when someone tells me they're eating all the deer now, I mean, it's laughable. It, 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 I don't wanna laugh, but usually my response is, there's 10 wolves, how much they're not killing machines. There are other things going on in the landscape. Yeah, and I'll just throw in one other comment. Thank you, Kim, that was an excellent point to raise. Um, but also, you know, we have found that the, the real reason why you see um, deer herds decline in East North Carolina has been because of the liberalization of hunting regulations. Yeah. So they're actually allowed to hunt deer longer throughout the year uh, they can take, you know, certain age classes and sexes of animals that aren't allowed other places. And, um, you know, the hunting seasons are naturally longer because it's a warmer climate. But unfortunately, the amount of deer that are harvested each year has sort of eked towards, you know, being unsustainable or at least having a negative um, a ramification for the population. So it's, it's, it's really easy to lay it at the feet of, uh, a, you know, a predator you're feeling you're competing with and not take responsibility for lax policy or your own 
um, you know, uh, over over harvesting of those animals as well. Thank you guys. And just a few more questions um, before we wrap up, because I um, do want to be, again, respectful of y'all's time and you guys have been so generous with it tonight. Um, but are there, you mentioned this a little bit earlier, Ben, I think, but are there any current um, strategies using federal incentives like tax credits for private landowners to create a safe space um, for red wolves on their property or involve them in conservation efforts like uh, camera traps? Yeah, yeah we've got um, camera traps. We've mentioned the enclosures, but I want Heather to talk about Pray for the Pack. So this is not a um, this is not a defenders program. This is actually a program that's being done um, in part by North Carolina Wildlife Federation and the US, um, US Fish and Wildlife Service. But as their partners, um, I will mention it because I think it's a really cool initiative that they've got going on. Um, so basically, they are it's an incentive program, um, not for having wolves on your property, but for doing um, types of habitat management and restoration um, or enhancement that will be better for the prey species that wolves um, depend on. So this won't require anyone to, um, you know, welcome wolves with open arms but it's going to help encourage people to um, work alongside fish and wildlife and really educate themselves about what's going on on their land and how they can manage that land um, for the health of all of the wildlife species there. And that just happens to include red wolves. Uh, one thing we found, and I think Kim will, will attest to this, is the area, uh, a lot of the people who are heavily involved are kind of just tired of hearing about red wolves. Um, so, you know, asking, asking people to engage in yet another, you know, super Red Wolf specific program is, is just exhausting. Um, so this is, we've really tried to expand our, our outreach to not just talking about the wolves, but talking about the ecosystem, talking about all of the wildlife there on the, um, on the landscape and how they all function together. So one thing, bit of research that's not been done here that is a question we get a lot. What are the effects of the red wolf, wolf on the ecosystem? There has not been any ecosystem research done here. It's, it's all anecdotal. Um, and maybe somewhere out there on this webinar is a, is a student that might want to come to Northeastern North Carolina and do a little bit of research. Oh, one thing I will mention, you know, someone asked about game cameras. So there's a pretty cool censusing project that the um, uh, one of our other partners, Wildlands Network, launched. It was really kind of a, you know, again, pushing back on the myths that Kim was exposing about, you know, where have all the deer gone? You know, they've all disappeared. It's all the red wolves fault. Well, we actually encouraged them to let us put game cameras on their property, which allowed us to show them like, actually, you've got a credible array of wildlife still using your property in these habitats. So yes, while some of the behaviors of deer may have changed, you may not see them in the same field you saw them with your grandfather, uh, those animals are here and they're thriving alongside red wolves. You know, the full complement of nature is, is, is there to enjoy. Thank you all. And um, now getting kind of into some ways that people can help, because I feel like that is a good way to wrap things up. Um, we have a follow-up question about um, the state uh, mammal idea. And Ben, you mentioned um, kids are uh, obviously a lot more um, persuasive than adults. So do we need an army of kids for um, pushing the state mammal? Um, what would be the best way for citizens to go about supporting that idea? Yeah, I, I don't know. I think we're, there's a, a, probably some more contemplation we would have to do to understand the mechanisms. You know, like I mentioned, it would require a piece of legislation. So one of the things I would want to uh, be certain that we had was a legislative champion who would be able to introduce support and co-sponsor that kind of legislation. Um, but I think it can sp start small and grow big. Uh, and I think we can look to other states that have had successful campaigns. We don't have to look too far because getting the gopher frog um, or Pine Barrens Tree Frog is the state amphibian in North Carolina was led by a single student. Uh, and I know I have Girl Scout uh, troops who've approached me interested in doing a similar campaign. So it's possible, but we do have to have that legislative champion. And I do think the timing certainly would be right, particularly if we get back into what I'm now calling the Red Wolf Renaissance. We're getting back to uh, what we have done best and get this population back where it deserves to be. Uh, may present a new opportunity for us to share that appreciation and pride across the state. 
Excellent. That is a great answer. And um, moving into kind of campaigns and everything that Defenders and the Red Wolf Coalition is currently engaged in, is there anything that citizens can do to help those efforts that you are currently engaged in? And also for Kim, um, is the Visitor Center Education Center reopened? And if not, when do you expect that to happen? So the Red Roof Education Center is run by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Bacosa and Lakes National Wildlife Refuge. It is not open. I have not heard. I asked last week and don't know. I can tell you this. Um, the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, who is um, overseeing the programs and the volunteers, they are getting ready to set up a webcam. And so once that is set up, I know we just moved the wolves yesterday out of the big enclosure into a smaller one. And so um, when that gets set up, certainly I will pass along to you, Christopher. Um, we'll put it on our social media. Um, I'm hoping it's soon. I think we've been sort of waiting since November for something to happen between the weather and COVID. It just didn't happen. So um, mm -hmm. that'll be really cool. Um, It'll be nice. Well, we have weather events here and I sit at home like a worried mom. So I'll be able to go online and make sure that Manny and Sage are doing well. And to, to, to talk a little bit about sort of what you all can do to help. Um, you know, I think <laughs> over the years, the Red Bull program, I feel like every few months we've got something we, we're asking folks to help us do uh, on advocacy, petitions, letters, that, et cetera. Um, you, you saw the slide we put up and I, and, I, and I will say this, you know, social media has become a very powerful tool for organizing and advocacy. Um, I think Red Wolf Coalition has one of the best social media presence, particularly related to Red Wolves for obvious reasons, but uh, always an incredible wealth of information that they're providing very regularly. Uh, Defenders, we also have a Red Wolf specific Facebook group that allows us to communicate directly with those advocates. So. I, it, it may sound cheap, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm being serious when I say this, to, to, to get on to Facebook and really join up with these groups. The other thing um, that I'll say, I'm not squeamish about it, but you know, all of the work that Kim, Heather, myself, we do, as well as our organization, depends on the, um, the support of folks like yourselves through financial uh, donations. You know, we are a nonprofit organization, which is a tax status, not a business model. But what it does mean is that we are fully funded uh, by, by, by private funds. So in order to do that, we do, um, we would love to have folks join as a member to the coalition, to defenders, to make those gifts. Every little bit helps. I'm always touched when I hear about school groups doing fundraisers. I had a, a group of middle school girls that um, uh, made bracelets they sold or were able to give a gift. Uh, and just other projects like that, even something like the Concert for Conservation, which has actually allowed us to help support the uh, transfer of wolves from, from um, St. Vincent to Alligator River and provide the pens they needed, the tools they needed to do that. So every little bit does go a long way. And, um, you know, you can, you can trust us to be um, very careful with resources and always put them towards the best interests of these animals first. Awesome. Well, I think that is a good way to end it. I think we've answered almost everyone's questions. Um, if anybody has any follow-up questions or if we missed a question that you had, feel free to email me, Christopher at wolfpark.org, and I will pass those questions along to our panelists uh, that we had tonight. Um, again, as a reminder, this webinar was recorded and it will be posted on YouTube. Uh, within the next 24 hours, most likely, if you want to go back and watch anything. Um, thank you again, Ben, Heather, and Kim, so much for you. your time tonight um, and educating us all on um, the current status of the Red Wolf and answering all of these great questions that all of the attendees um, sent in. Um, so thank you again, and we hope to see um, some of you back for our next Wolf Park webinar. Um, again, thank you to Defenders of Wildlife and Red Wolf Coalition for um, helping with this webinar. And to everyone watching, go follow them on social media. Your voice matters. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. We really appreciate it.